r slash no sleep hosted by you slash errols okay the witch's grave part one the woods the woods it was caleb who told us about the church in the woods caleb knew every urban legend in town me and his twin sister beck would go along with him in search of proof and a glimpse of the supernatural there was the lizard man the haunted frog pond and the murder house on ash street there was the abandoned sanatorium where a cult performed black magic and human sacrifices, and the bunny bridge, which was said to be a portal into hell. They were all easily debunked. The lizard man was arrested for illegally owning and selling exotic wild animals. The haunted frog pond wasn't haunted, but it was disgusting. It was full of algae, condoms, cigarette butts, and who knows what else. The Ash Murder House was the scene of a brutal family murder but no longer exists, as it was demolished a few years ago and transformed into a memorial garden. The sanatorium, while incredibly creepy, housed no cult, just a group of acid-dropping goths who were happy to share their drugs with us. And the Bunny Bridge was not a portal to hell but the home of territorial wasps who had taken the bridge as their own. And then there was the church in the woods and the cemetery surrounding it. The legend in town said a powerful witch lived there, surrounded by the graves of her children. They said if she caught you trespassing, she would steal your soul and keep you for eternity as her child. It was interesting, sure, especially as try as we might, we could never find the church. There was a ritual you had to perform, and of course, none of us knew what that entailed. We figured it was just the adult's way of scaring us into staying out of the woods. When Caleb talked about the other legends, it was with harmless fascination. The church was different. He spoke about it in hushed reverence. He wanted to be the first to find it, and he vowed he would. I'm going to find it, he said one night as we ate pizza and watched movies. Sure, Beck said, her mouth full of sauce and cheese. You do that, Caleb. I am, he said, uncharacteristically serious. I'm going to find it, guys, I will, and then I'll show you. Beck and I shared a look, and she shrugged. Okay, she said. We believe you. I saw little of Caleb for the rest of the year, and I forgot all about the church. The school year had started, and as a senior, I was so busy that I had no time to think of urban legends. Instead, I focused on my AP classes, college applications, counseling meetings, applying for scholarships, midterms, finals, and prom. As busy as we were, me and Beck made time for one another. We had been dating for five years, and I was a regular fixture at her house, as mine was hectic because of my four younger brothers. That was the night that changed everything. It was a typical Friday night with Beck and me eating pizza and watching some crappy horror films. I asked her how Caleb was doing, as his absence was pronounced tonight. He would usually join us. Is he okay? I haven't seen him around lately. You wouldn't, Beck said. He's basically on house arrest. Dad found out he's failing three classes and might not graduate. He's allowed to go to school in the bathroom, and that's it. She said this casually, but I knew that she was worried. What's going on with him, Beck? I asked. But she wouldn't look at me, and I changed the subject. We were fully engrossed in the movie when Caleb burst into Beck's room. His eyes were wide and manic, and with his wild hair and untamed beard, I barely recognized him. Lured. Beck. You guys, I did it. I did it, I finally found it. Stop it, Caleb, Beck said sharply. Get out, or I'll call dad. Caleb ignored his sister and set his attention on me. He was trembling in his excitement. I found it, lured. I found the church. I was confused at first, and then realization dawned on me. You found it? I said in genuine amazement. How? Caleb went into a long-winded explanation that I didn't even attempt to follow. The trees. I figured out that you have to trust the trees. And then the crows follow them, but not the bats, the bats are liars. And the grave. The baby's grave. It's there, it's all there. He babbled nonsensically and paced back and forth. He looks crazy, I thought. He looks possessed. Was this what he had been doing this entire year? talking to trees and following crows? His obsession had pushed him over the edge. Will you come, you guys? Please, you said you would come. No, Beck said. Sure, I said. We looked at one another. I had to admit that I was curious. Nobody had ever found the church, and this would probably be the end of our search for urban legends because, in a few months, we would head off to college. Beck looked tired. She gnawed on her bottom lip. I squeezed her hand gently. Come on, I whispered. We said we would, after all. 
She rolled her eyes and ran a hand through her choppy hair. Fine, she snapped. Fine. If we do this, and he sees there's nothing there but his delusions, maybe he'll finally wake the fuck up. I smiled at her, and she smiled back, but it was strained, and I saw fear flickering in her eyes. Beck drove, and Caleb talked non-stop the entire ride to the woods. He told us about the twisted trees and the talking animals he encountered. He spoke about the faces in the fog and the cemetery with sunken headstones. I looked at his reflection in the rearview window. His eyes were wild, and there was sweat on his upper lip. His hands gesticulated wildly as he talked. Before we left, Beck pulled me aside as Caleb went to his room to bring the supplies. Whatever those were. Are you sure you want to do this? He's been freaking me out, lured. It's beyond obsession now. Let's do it, I urged. We both know that we won't be doing this anymore after we graduate. I know you're curious because I am. Beck said nothing. She was still biting her lip. I am, she admitted. But I'm also scared. What if this is a trap? She said, like the real Caleb is gone, and this Caleb is leading us there to feed us to the witch. Beck, I laughed. That is the plot of the shitty movie we just watched. I know, but lured, he's been so weird this entire year. I mean, weirder than usual. She fell silent again, clearly weighing the options in her head. Okay, fine, all right, let's go, but don't die and have your ghost come crying to me because I told you so. After seeing Caleb like this, though, Beck's uncertainty about the situation made sense. As if reading my thoughts, Caleb stopped mid-sentence and met my gaze. He smiled at me and bared his teeth. A trickle of dark blood ran down one nostril, and his eyes rolled back into his head, exposing wet empty sockets. I gasped, but when I blinked, the blood was gone, and Caleb looked at me curiously. His eyes were tired but completely normal. I smiled nervously and turned back to face the road. Are you okay? Beck asked, glancing at me. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, just excited. It had just been a trick of the light, I assured myself. Nothing else. But for the rest of the ride, I felt him looking at me, and I knew he was smiling. The woods aren't woods so much as it is a groves. It's relatively big, and the paths are confusing, if you aren't familiar with the area, you'll get lost. Exploring the woods is a rite of passage for the kids in town. We grew up splashing in the dirty creek and digging in the ground, looking for gold. All we ever unearthed were fat earthworms and clusters of pill bugs. At night, we would run through it under a blanket of black sky and silver stars. We played tag, climbed trees, and waded in that gross water. I live close to the woods. You could technically call it my backyard. Beck parked on the curb by my house. It was completely dark outside. Good, I thought. Everyone was sleeping or out for the night. I wasn't sure which, so just in case, I gestured to Beck and Caleb to be quiet, and we tiptoed to the backyard. There was no point, though, because the gate screeched as I opened it, but the lights blessedly remained off, and I breathed a sigh of relief. We approached the woods, me and Beck hesitated while Caleb walked ahead. I held Beck's hand, and she smiled at me, and then we followed Caleb into the darkness. We had a witch to find. Maybe it was because my imagination was running wild, but I swear that when we entered the woods, it grew significantly darker. The tree's branches swayed in the wind, sprinkling us with droplets of rain, and the ground was thick with mud. We said nothing while we followed Caleb, but I could tell that Beck was annoyed. Her body was tense with frustration, and her lips were thin as she chewed on the words she was dying to spit out. It was nearly midnight, and the sky was pitch black. There were no stars, just the moon, dim and yellow. Honestly, I was disappointed. With us learning that the church and which were real, I thought the woods would change into a landscape of phantasmagorical horrors, complete with thick fog and disembodied whispers warning us to leave. It was creepy, but the same woods I had walked in hundreds of times before. The only difference was the volumes of sound that had increased tenfold the babble of water, the chirp of bugs, and the low hoot of an owl. This was the soundtrack of the night. Caleb was quiet, a dramatic turn from how talkative he had been the entire ride here. His lips were pinched and white in a determined grimace, and his eyes were serious. We had been walking for around 10 minutes when he suddenly stopped. I nearly stumbled into him, and Beck glared at his backside as though, with her gaze, she could set him on fire. We were at a junction that divided itself into many paths. The left led to the highway, the right led to the creek, and the centermost one took you to the farmhouse, an abandoned, dilapidated relic that the county pretended didn't exist. Caleb was muttering to himself. He took out a pouch, opened it, and poured its contents onto the ground. 
I saw bits of wheat, corn, raisins, and sunflowers. It was birdseed. What the hell is he doing? I thought. Beck opened her mouth, but Caleb held up his hand. Please, he said, still spreading the birdseed. I can't have anyone interrupt me. This was the Caleb I knew. Intelligent and methodical. He stood still for a moment. It had become very quiet, even the wind had stopped. I could only hear Caleb's heavy breathing. It looked as though he were stealing himself for something. He nodded and then pulled something out of his bag. And it took me a moment to realize that it was a knife. Before I could say anything or even react, Caleb held his hand out and slashed at his palm. I gasped, Beck shrieked, and Caleb was silent except for his blood dripping onto the ground. Beck was pissed, and she rushed toward him. She stopped in her tracks as Caleb looked at her. His eyes were wild and angry. She gawked at him but didn't say a word. Beck was the oldest by nine minutes and was the stereotypical tough, bossy sister, while Caleb was her opposite, he was shy and sweet. I had never seen him like this before, and Beck hadn't either. Dark blood streamed down Caleb's wrist, and dripped off his fingertips like rain. I felt sick but watched transfixed as each droplet of blood stained and seeped into the bird seed. We heard them before we saw them. It was a low buzzing, like an annoying fly invading your personal space but times that by 100. The buzzing crescendoed into deep guttural croaking. Beck and I looked at one another and then stared at the sky. Even in the darkness, we could see it, a dark cloud coming closer and closer. There is no fucking way, I thought. What the fuck? They were crows, dozens and dozens of crows flying towards us, their maniacal cawing so loud that I temporarily went deaf. There were so many of them they blocked out the faraway moon. We were plunged into absolute darkness, and now deaf and blind, I could only feel their presence. Their feathers struck my face. A group of crows is called a murder, I thought wildly. Murder 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 murder. And then my senses returned to me. The moon reappeared, and I watched as they flew towards Caleb and descended onto the bird seat hungrily. It was silent except for the clicking of beaks. What in the absolute fuck? Beck muttered. Caleb, what the fuck is going on? Caleb turned his gaze away from the crows he had been watching with interest. They ate the bird seed until it was gone and then, in complete synchronization, took flight toward the path on the left. Caleb looked at us with a slight grin on his face. I told you we must follow the crows, he said. Dramatic much? Beck said under her breath. Caleb ignored her. His eyes tracked the crows. Let's, he said, and then he stopped. He looked scared. My stomach dropped as I followed his gaze, and my heart pounded so hard it hurt. Two shadowy figures emerged from the thicket of trees ahead of us, and I felt the hate, the evil emanating from them. They staggered toward us, hands outstretched, reaching with long, thin fingers. And I know that this is the witch and her minion, ready to gouge out our eyes and eat our souls. I screamed. Beck screamed. Caleb screamed. And then, shockingly, his shriek cut off and turned into laughter. Oh, you guys came. You made it, he said gleefully. I blinked, and the shadows came into focus. The moonlight unveiled them. A boy and a girl around our age stared back at us. The girl's full lips were twisted into a sly smile. What was she doing here? I thought. Oh God, not you, Beck said, her voice dripped with disdain. What are you doing here? The girl in front of us was still smiling. Her pretty brown face was arrogant, and her hair was long and woven into tiny braids. She pushed a braid out of her face with one long, lacquered nail. I could ask the same of you, Rebecca, she said snidely. Why are you here? Caleb is my brother, dumbass. I don't have to answer you. And Caleb is my boyfriend, Rebecca. I don't have to answer you either. Beck turned to Caleb, enraged. You told me you guys broke up, she said, and Caleb had the grace to look ashamed. He looked down at the ground, his cheeks burning. Well, we did, but then Madeline. Madeline sauntered over to Caleb and wrapped her arms around his waist. She glared at Beck. Why do you think we must tell you everything about our relationship? What's it to you? The two started to bicker, and Caleb attempted to calm them down, but they ignored him as if he wasn't there. Who are you? I said to the boy, who looked like he would love nothing more than to disappear back into the trees. He looked like a pale version of Madeline with bright red hair. Ezra, um, I'm Ezra, he cleared his throat. Madeline's brother. Half-brother, Madeline corrected, pausing her fight with Beck. She stared daggers at Ezra. Ezra rolled his eyes. Right, her half-brother. Madeline needed a ride here and didn't want to go in alone. 
she failed her driving test again and shut up ezra madeline screeched he smirked and i did too right sorry she did not fail her test for the third time she just needed a chaperone madeline looked murderous i laughed i liked ezra already caleb and madeline had been dating on and off since seventh grade mostly off because of madeline she and beck had once been friends but then something had shifted and the once besties were now enemies why were you guys hiding behind the tree i asked why were you trying to scare us ezra had the decency to look ashamed but madeline burst into peals of laughter we got you didn't we phew the look on your faces was so funny no it wasn't funny madeline you stupid cow beck snapped you're lucky if i don't drop kick you that started a fresh round of bickering my head was starting to hurt uh guys i said can we keep moving i want to go to sleep before dawn they stopped and beck said sorry she sheepishly came to my side while madeline hugged caleb's waist lead the way beck said somewhat resignedly we're all here so time to meet this witch caleb smiled and gestured toward the trees where the crows perched they flew towards the tree and the trees parted some bent and others uprooted themselves their branches arched and their trunks twisted to reveal a hidden path a path that shimmered in a kaleidoscope of patterns made up of colors i have no name for i don't think there is a word to describe how i felt at this moment but if i had to settle on one it would be enchanted it deepened with every step i took what is this place that ceremony blood and crows have revealed i'm tripping much harder than the time i took acid in that rotting asylum i liked it though i could see the air moving and the wind was calling my name the trees whispered to one another and the crows again perched themselves on their waving branches silent and staring they saw everything this is it i thought giddily this is where i want to die i do not know where that thought came from and i don't care there was a rumbling underneath me that made my entire body shake and without looking i knew those crooked trees had straightened and returned to their respective roots i know that the path behind us is closed the bats were following me and they told me horrible things somebody died in the creek you know a young boy one whispered his body was swollen and blue when they fished him out another bat sneered and when they placed him on the dirt his stomach burst and was full of maggots don't you want to know what the farmer's wife thought as he bashed her head open the third bat giggled oh the things your mind says as you're dying you'd be surprised oh you would be surprised the bats are liars caleb had said okay but a boy had drowned in the creek we had been friends and i remember seeing the police officers trudge into the woods and come out holding a large black bag looking pale and the farmer in that farmhouse had murdered his wife and then shot himself with his shotgun after not lies truths i wondered if anybody else was experiencing what i was i looked around me and beck was pale madeline's eyes were wide and afraid and ezra's cheeks were wet with tears and when he looked at me i saw that his eyes were red only caleb looked unperturbed maybe beck was right i thought perhaps he had made a deal with the witch and we were his sacrifices she won't take your eyes the bat said so close to my ear that its fur tickled me she'll rip out your heart and make you eat it and then she'll bury you alive stop i muttered and shooted away go away you little shit i tried to focus on where i was and where we were going beck's hand was warm and soft in my own which grounded me it's quiet and the crows unfurled in the sky like streaming ribbons occasionally they shed a feather and it drifted down 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 i caught one and marveled at its beauty it shimmered in my hand it was embedded with dark jewels i turned it over for further inspection and when i did the jewels shifted and crawled over my wrist they trailed down my arm and crept up my neck they burrowed themselves into my hair i dropped the feather and pat meted myself as if i were on fire i itched all over they fell off me like raindrops and scurried away on the rainbow trail those aren't jewels i thought feeling sick they're bugs beck looked disgusted she said nothing but i knew she wanted to the deeper we walked into the woods the trippier it became the sky was red i saw no moon or sun everything was burning the flat ground transformed into crumbling cobblestone and i know i shouldn't be amazed after everything i've experienced so far but oh i was my body vibrated with every step and it thrummed with energy it felt good it felt really really good the air changed it smelled sweet but unpleasant 
It reminded me of the smell of rotting fruit. The trees were breathing. Slow inhales and loud exhales that made their branches quiver. Everything around me was shimmering, and I was blinded by sensations and colors. My vision distorted, and what I saw was terrifying. Beck's eyes were large black pools, and her mouth was wide and screaming. Madeline's mouth was stretched from ear to ear like a smug Cheshire cat. Her teeth were very sharp. Ezra's red hair was on fire, and when I looked at him, I saw that his eyes had burst and ran down his face like yolk. Caleb turned to look at me, and he was bloated and blue. When he opened his mouth to speak, wriggling maggots dribbled out. His mouth kept moving, but I couldn't hear him. All I heard was a high keening whistle. It grew higher and higher, and I felt something hot and wet drip out of my ears, and when I touched it, my fingers came away smeared with dark red blood. My blood clumped together and then broke apart. It transformed into ruby red jewels that then turned into bugs. They climbed up my arm and chewed through my neck. They dug into the whirls and spirals of my brain. My skull burned, and I heard screams. Blood-curdling screams that made the leaves on the trees curl and fall to the ground, smoldering. The screams went on and on, and more blood leaked from my ears. It sprayed from my nose like a geyser and trickled from my eyes like tears. I couldn't see, hear or breathe. I was drowning in blood. And then everything went black, the screaming stopped, and the world was silent. I opened my eyes. I was on the ground. The sky no longer burned, it was black and starless. Beck and Ezra's terrified faces loomed over me. Beck's skin was milk white, and she was crying. Are you okay? She asked after they helped X me up. I'm fine, I replied, but my voice shook, and my hands were trembling and smeared with dried blood. What is happening? What happened? Beck didn't answer, instead, she whirled on Caleb. He stood to the side with a scared looking Madeline. His face was blank, and Beck's contorted in rage. We are done, she spat. I don't give a shit about any of this anymore, Caleb. Lurd is bleeding from her fucking ears and eyes and nearly didn't wake up, and you're just standing there. You cut yourself like some goddamn sacrifice. I'm done. We. Are. Done. She repeated. Fuck you, and fuck this fucking place and this so-called witch. You can stay, but we are out. She didn't wait for a response. She grabbed my wrist and practically dragged me down the path from whence we had come. The paths closed, Caleb called behind us. You can't get out that way. I'm the only one who knows the way. I know what to do to get in and get out. Beck's shrieks were incomprehensible. Then tell me how to get the fuck out, Caleb, you fucking asshole. Besides, Caleb said, ignoring her. We're already here. What? Beck and I looked at one another and then turned around. I gasped, and Beck muttered more curses. It was there. We were there. There were faces in the fog of all ages and genders. The only similarity was their eyes. They're closed as though they were sleeping. The church loomed in the distance on a hill. It's made of crumbling, white brick weathered by time and lack of care. Its door was painted a dull, dirty gray, and on top of its small structure was a steeple. It housed a church bell that swayed gently in the breeze. Surrounding the church were dozens of old headstones, they jutted from the ground like crooked teeth. The fog rested there like a blanket. Beck and I had rejoined the group, and we stared at the scenery before us. I can't believe it's real, it's fucking real, I heard Beck mutter. I looked at Caleb, and I was shocked to see him kneeling on the ground, crying. Hello, he sobbed. I'm here again. Yeah, this was weird. I understood, though. The church and its cemetery were hauntingly beautiful. The scenery reminded me of a fairy tale, a macabre fairy tale, sure, but a fairy tale nevertheless. The sky was cloudless and light blue, and the sun beamed down on the church seraphically. Everything was beautiful. This was where the witch lived? Caleb had finally stopped crying and swiped at his wet cheeks, he stood up. He turned to the rest of us, his smile wide and familiar. I had missed that smile, and a sudden wave of sadness washed over me. It had been so long since I last saw that smile. We're here, you guys. We're finally here. Didn't I tell you? Isn't this amazing? Nobody knew what to say. I mean, what is there to say? We were here, and it was pretty amazing. We had finally found truth in an urban legend. Well, partial truth. We had yet to see the witch. Beck, who had also been gazing at the church in stunned awe, shook herself out of it as though she just remembered how mad she had been at Caleb ten minutes ago. She scowled. Great, yeah, incredible. It's amazing. So when are we going? How do we get out? 
Caleb's brow furrowed as if he didn't understand what she was saying. Get out? He repeated, puzzled. Yeah, Caleb, get out. This has been fun and everything, but it's getting late or early, Beck glanced at the sun. Can we go? But we just got here, Rebecca. We haven't even seen the witch. Do you not see how creepy this is? How weird it all feels. It feels just fine. God, I am so tired of you bossing me around. We only do what you want to do. Caleb was wrong, though. Beck was right. It doesn't feel good here. It was beautiful, but everything was wrong. My skin prickled with goosebumps. Ezra and Madeline looked as uncomfortable as I felt. Madeline stared at the church as quietly as a mouse, her mouth was ajar. How do we leave? Beck asked again. You said you know how. I do, Caleb said. Then do it. No. Then tell us. No. Beck grabbed Caleb's bag, snarling, and Caleb slapped her hands away. She bit him, and he yelped. They slap fought one another, and she put him in a headlock until he dropped it. Beck picked it up, and she stuck her tongue out at him and opened it. She pulled out a notebook, frowning. She flipped through its pages and then threw it at him. It's fucking empty, you asshole. I know. Caleb shot back, and he rubbed his bruised arm. He tapped his head. It's all up here, I told you. Tell. Me, Beck said through gritted teeth. No. Come on. We have to find the witch, and you guys will see. Caleb turned on his heels and walked towards the church, but he wasn't looking at where he was going. He didn't notice the small grave marker that poked out of the dirt. If he had, he surely would have stepped over it. And if he had tripped and the bigger headstone behind it wasn't there, he would have just landed face first in the dirt. But none of that happened, and that grave was there, and as much as I have wished to change the past, it's already been written and set in stone. When Caleb tripped over the grave marker, I saw the look of surprise on his face. He looked ridiculous at that moment like he wanted to say oh shit, this is going to hurt. I shut my eyes, but it was too late. It wouldn't have done me good, anyway. The sound of Caleb's neck breaking would haunt me forever. The quiet that followed is the longest I have ever experienced. I never knew silence could be so loud. And then the air was ripped open by Beck's raw, guttural screams. She ran towards Caleb, and we followed her numb. Ezra helped as we turned him over carefully while Madeline danced around us, squealing in a small voice, don't move him. Don't move him. Oh, you're not supposed to move him. We do, and Madeline looked at him and turned her head to vomit. I took a quick intake of breath. Caleb's head was bent to one side, and his eyes were open and blood red. They were moving and flitted from me to Ezra to Beck. They fixed on Beck, and his lips quivered as though he was trying to smile. Beck was patting his hand and crying while telling him he was good and fine. We're going to get help for you, okay? You're fine, you're fine, you'll be okay. I love you. I love you. Don't leave me like mom. I love you. Please. Please. And then Caleb's eyes stopped moving. They stared up at the sky. His hand went limp in Beck's hand, and she grabbed onto him even tighter, her screams were animalistic and primal. She refused to let go of him. I didn't know what to do and I couldn't breathe. I felt robbed of all my senses. How is it fair that, in a second, life could change everything so drastically? He was just here. He had been talking and fighting with Beck. He had been smiling. This was a dream, I thought frantically. Wake up, lured. Wake up. But I was awake, it was Caleb who was asleep. I am so full and heavy with grief that, temporarily, I forget where we are. The church bell reminded me. The wind picked up, and the bell slammed against the steeple wall so hard that I thought it would crack. The sky was darkening with a convergence of clouds. They overtook all the light of the sun. The wind was furious and blew my hair into my face. But in the wind, I heard a disembodied voice. It was Caleb, and his words made my blood run cold. I'm the only one who knows how to get out of here, Caleb had said. It's all up here. Oh, no. This was very bad. Posted by you slash Errol's okay. The Witch's Grave, Part 2, The Cemetery I met Caleb before I met Beck. We sat next to one another in 7th grade marine bio. We had to dissect a fish together. I don't remember what species of fish it had been, only that it stank so badly that I swayed in my seat and nearly passed out. Caleb noticed and immediately took the scalpel from me, ignoring my protests. I've got this, he said. You can take the notes. And he cut the fish open by himself while I jotted down the notes. We became friends after that. 
there's something about eviscerating a dead fish that brings you together. Caleb introduced me to Beck. Caleb held Beck's hand as she came out to their father, and Caleb took us around town to uncover its secrets. And now Caleb was dead. Beck wailed over his body, and Madeline vomited into a bush. I was distraught, and I was angry. I was angry at myself because I was thinking about the possibility of us being stuck here when I should have been focusing on the death of one of my best friends. But I couldn't help it. If Caleb had been the only one who knew how to get out, we were screwed beyond screwed. Ezra crouched over Beck, rubbed her back, and talked soothingly. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but whatever it was worked. He helped Beck to her feet and wrapped her in a hug. As she walked towards me, Ezra took off his jacket and gently placed it over Caleb's face. I embraced Beck, and she began to cry again. Her body shook with sobs, and I didn't know what to say so I just held her. Eventually her tears subsided and she pushed away from me. She stared at the sky with red eyes, her tears left tracks on her cheeks. Ezra stood by Madeline, who had stopped throwing up. He reached to take her hand, and she recoiled from his touch. Her hands curled into fists, and she marched towards us, and before I could do anything, she slapped Beck and raised her hand to do it again. I jumped between them, and Ezra grabbed Madeline and held her back. Madeline screeched and clawed at the air like a cat. Beck didn't react. She kept staring at the sky, her cheek bright red. Let me go. Madeline screamed. Let me go, Ezra. It's her fault that Caleb is dead. It's all her fault. It's not her fault, I yelled angrily. How dare you? This isn't her fault at all. That angered her even more, and she lunged at me. Ezra was lean and tall while Madeline was petite, he easily pulled her away. Cut it out, Maddie, he said sharply. I know you're hurting, we all are, but it isn't Beck's fault. Madeline laughed, it was cruel and ugly. How is it not her fault? She fought with him, and he fell. She did it. She did not, Ezra said sadly. He tripped and fell. We saw it. He wouldn't have tripped if they hadn't fought. He would be okay, he would still be here and not dead. She crumpled to the ground, sobbing, and Ezra hugged her. I was grateful that he was here. He was the calm voice of reason amidst tragedy. I don't know how he did it, but he must have had a lot of practice dealing with hysterics with Madeline as a sister. Do you think Caleb would want you blaming his twin? I heard him mutter to Madeline. It is my fault, a small voice said to my left. Beck. I turned to her and grabbed her hands. It's not your fault, I said firmly. It's not your fault at all, Beck. She wouldn't look at me. But it is, she whispered. My brother is gone just like mom. They're both gone. I didn't know what to say to that, so I drew her to me again. She wrapped her arms around me, and over her shoulder, I looked at Caleb's still body, Ezra's jacket a shroud over his face. How are we going to get out? Ezra said. He was looking at the thicket of trees we had come from. Madeline rolled her eyes. Do you really think we're stuck here? As if Caleb had some secret powers that let us here? It's a trick, you guys, a joke. We get back by walking out of here, of course. Ezra looked dubious, and while I hoped she was right, from what we had been experiencing, I didn't think it was that simple. Madeline looked at us and rolled her eyes again. You guys are such pussies. Watch. She stomped towards the trees, and her confidence gave me hope. Maybe she's right, I thought. Perhaps it was just a joke. We'll be okay, we'll get out. And then she stopped abruptly. What the fuck? She muttered. What is it? Ezra said, he walked over to her. She said nothing, and my curiosity got the better of me. Come on, I said to Beck, who was sitting on the ground, staring at Caleb's body. Let's see what's going on. Hesitantly, she took my hand, and I helped her up. We had nearly reached Madeline and Ezra when Ezra shouted. Madeline, stop. And then there was the sound of something sizzling, the smell of burning, and Madeline's scream ripped through the air. She fell to the ground, gripping her hand. We ran toward them, and Ezra shot out his arm to prevent us from going further. He looked sick. Don't. Don't go any farther. What is that? I asked. The air in front of us was rippling, shimmering like sunlight reflecting on water. It was beautiful. Gorgeous. Entranced, I reached out to touch it. Ezra grabbed my hand and held it. Don't, he said, voice tight. Madeline was still holding her hand, howling. I spotted something on the ground. It was small and shaped like an eraser on a pencil. I frowned and picked it up and then dropped it in disgust. It was the tip of a finger with a melted pink acrylic nail attached to it. The smell of burning flesh was so strong, 
And when I looked at Madeline's hand, I retched. The tip of her pointer finger was gone, but there was no blood. The wound was smooth and looked as though it had been cauterized. I looked at that invisible shimmering wall. It had sliced Madeline's finger off. Beck's face was expressionless. She picked the nub of Madeline's finger up off the ground and rotated it slowly, mildly interested. There's like a force field here, Ezra said, gesturing at it. Like a barrier. I don't think we can leave this way. Are you okay? Does it hurt? I asked Madeline. She looked up at me, tears in her eyes. No, it doesn't hurt. It did it first. It hurt a lot. She flexed her hand and inspected it. This is so weird. That's good, I said. I'm glad it doesn't hurt. I turned to Beck and Ezra, who examined the barrier, careful not to touch it. Ezra gingerly poked it with a stick he had found and jumped back as it caught on fire. Beck? I said. Hmm? She replied distractedly. Are you sure there was nothing in Caleb's notebook? Like positively sure? Her face scrunched. I'm not sure, she admitted. I mean, there could have been something I missed. We should look at it, I said. There might be something in it that could help us. Beck nodded. Her eyes were still red, but I saw the determination in them and the way she set her jaw. I think I threw it over there, she said and pointed towards the cemetery. It. Her words were cut off by her sudden gasp. Her eyes went wide with terror and her entire body began to shake. I whipped my head around so fast my neck cracked. I froze, and my heart pounded in my chest. The door to the church was wide open, and a figure stood at its entrance. The figure was tall and as white as a ghost. It bent at the waist and stood crookedly to one side, as though its back were broken. The darkness that flooded out of the doorway especially pronounced its whiteness. It had wild white hair and wore a shaggy white robe. Its face was the color of chalk, and its lips were bright red with a smile that stretched from ear to ear. The smile revealed rows and rows of sharp white teeth. I couldn't breathe. It was as though the air had been sucked out and replaced with this drowning feeling. My lungs wouldn't expand. I am going to suffocate, I thought. What is that? I said when I could breathe again. It's the witch, Beck breathed. The witch, it's her. Ezra had gone very still, and Madeline was breathing so hard that I thought she would pass out. It's the witch, I thought. The witch, she's real. The witch, the witch, the witch. Beck's scream crashed through my thoughts. She's got him. She's got him. She pointed at the church, hysterical. Caleb. Caleb. Caleb's body was lying at the witch's feet, Ezra's jacket wrapped around his neck like a noose. The witch stared at us, still smiling crookedly. Her long tongue ran over pointy teeth, leaving a smear of something dark red. Blood. She raised a long finger and bent it in a come-hither motion. Caleb's body turned right side up, standing. His head flopped to the side like a rag doll, and when the witch bent her finger again, his body slowly began to turn and twist. His joints broke one by one. His spine snapped, his hips popped, and his ribs cracked. Stop! Beck screamed. Please stop! But his body kept twisting, kept turning, kept breaking, and then... It stopped and Caleb's body was as crooked as the witch's, contorted beyond recognition. The wind kicked up and showered us in dirt and through slitted eyes, I saw that the witch was still staring at us. And then I heard her. Her voice sounded like broken glass had shredded her throat. A croak punctuated each word. It was as though she were speaking directly into my ear. You will not leave, she rasped. You are mine. You are mine. You will not go. My bladder let go. I pissed myself, and warm pee trickled down my leg. And then she and Caleb were gone as if they had disappeared with the wind. The church's door slammed closed, and the witch left us numb and terrified in her wake. Beck threw herself at the door, Ezra and I right behind her. Caleb! She screamed, pounding on it. Caleb! Caleb, please! Ezra and I looked at one another. He shrugged and grabbed the door handle, twisting and shaking but it didn't budge. Beck was still screaming, she was hysterical. Her laughter was piercing and wild, and her eyes rolled in her head. So many terrible things had happened, but this scared me the most. She was having a mental break and slipping into insanity. She's losing it, I thought. She's losing it, and who could blame her? Beck kept laughing and crying, laughing and crying. Intervals of madness. She was losing her sanity, and I didn't know what to say or do. Something shoved me hard, and I nearly fell over. Move, Madeline snarled, and without hesitation, she slapped Beck hard across the face. Beck stopped laughing and stared at her, dazed. 
Madeline smacked her again. She grabbed her shirt collar and pulled her close. Get it the fuck together, Rebecca. She snarled. For you, for Caleb, for all of us. There's enough shit we have to deal with it, so get it together. She slapped her once more, and I winced. Overkill, I thought. But Beck's eyes were bright and clear now. I never thought I would be grateful for Madeline. There was an awkward silence that hung in the air. Thank you, Beck said quietly, rubbing her cheek. Thanks, Maddie. Madeline smiled at her. You're welcome, Beck. How's your finger, Maddie? Ezra asked dryly. Madeline flipped him off. This one is perfect. The sun was setting, and the horizon burned. I walked in its orange light and looked for the notebook while Ezra and Beck tried to open the door. Madeline sat on the crumbling steps examining her hand. It's like it's cemented shut, Beck groaned as they pushed all their weight on it. The notebook was near where Caleb had snapped his neck, on top of the memorial plaque. I stepped around the headstones gingerly and picked the notebook up. I paused and frowned as I read the plaque's engraved inscription. It said. Baby. Oh 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 to oh 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 oh. And underneath that was a crude drawing of a stork. Caleb's words from earlier ran through my head. The trees. I figured out that you have to trust the trees. And then the crows follow them, but not the bats, the bats are liars. And the grave. The baby's grave. It's there, it's all there. Before I could stop myself, I brushed the epigraph with my fingers, and the words began to glow red. Crouching over the grave, I looked through the notebook carefully. It was blank, just as Beck had said. But as I reached the end, I spotted a litany of words written on the bottom right of the page in Caleb's neat script. The bell. Dirt. Drown. Burial. Sacrifice. Not much, but it was something. I closed the notebook. Guys? I called. They stopped what they were doing and hurried over to me. Their faces glowed as they stood in front of the headstone. What is this? Beck asked. She bent to read the inscription and then looked up at me. The baby's grave. I nodded. Yup, the one he talked about. Why is it glowing? Ezra asked. He looked unnerved. I touched it, I admitted. I touched it, and it just started doing this. I also found this. I showed them what Caleb had written. Beck rolled her eyes. Of course, so cryptic he can't write full sentences. So, we have to get to the bell, Madeline said. She was looking up at the steeple, doubt all over her face. Easier said than done. The walls of the church were smooth despite its dilapidated state. There would be no way to climb it to reach the bell. It wasn't a particularly tall building, but if you fell, it would hurt. Looks like it, Ezra said. He was still looking at the glowing grave. But we have to get in somehow, and I don't think the door is how. Maybe. He trailed off. Maybe? I prompted. Maybe we're not meant to get in that way. He gestured towards the church door. He walked around the expanse of the cemetery and eventually crouched in front of a small white one. He paused and pressed his hand onto it. Underneath his palm, it glowed an ethereal shade of gold. He looked over at us. This one says child, but with sixes instead of zeros. And there's a drawing of a face. He looked sick. A face with eyes but no mouth. I'm guessing the numbers are the ages they died. He frowned. But what does any of this mean? I have no idea, I said, I looked around, and another grave caught my eye. It was in much better condition than the others. It looked brand new. My heart was beating fast, and it leapt into my throat as I read the epigraph. Somebody died in the creek, you know, a young boy. That boy had been my friend. He had lived next door, but when he died, his family had moved away. It had been years since it happened, and nobody talked about it. Nothing was exciting or mysterious about his death. A young boy had drowned. Case closed. Just an ordinary tragedy in an average town. It happens all the time. I had seen the police carry his body out of the woods, and I had gone to the funeral with my parents and brothers. We hadn't gone to the cemetery afterward because, as my mom told me, his parents had him burned so he could always be with them, no matter where they went. So why was his headstone here? It said. Aiden Green. Drowned. And a drawing of a body, its stomach bursting and crawling with bugs. Wordlessly I pressed my hand to the smooth stone, which glowed dark blue. The color of the water Aiden had drowned in. I have never told anybody that I had watched him die. It has always been my secret. A memory that I've buried and left to rot, but sometimes I dreamed about it, and sometimes I wished I had been the one that died. 
I watched as the headstone blurred and the drawing transformed. It was as though the stars were projecting onto his grave the last picture of Aiden Green ever to grace the earth. His body lay on the muddy banks, and his eyes were open and full dirt and algae. Dark liquid seeped through his puffy lips, his stomach was bloated, and I knew it was full of bugs. And then it changed. The dead boy turned into a dead girl. Her hair was long and curly, and her skin was dark brown. Her stomach had burst open, and from her innards, flowers bloomed. Me. It was me. It confirmed what I had already known. I was supposed to have drowned that day. Not Aiden. We had been waiting in the river and trying to catch small fish in our cupped hands. This is where things get hazy. It's as though someone has stabbed my memory and left it full of holes. One moment Aiden and I were splashing each other and laughing, and the next, I was flailing in the river, trying to scream, but I swallowed mouthful after mouthful of water. And then I'm lying on the ground, shivering and terrified. I watched helplessly as the water overtook and swallowed Aiden. He never resurfaced, no matter how much I screamed and begged. He was gone. I remember running through the woods, cold and scared, but I did not slow down. I ran until I reached my house, locked myself in my room, and cried in my bed for the rest of the day. They found Aiden two days later and would have found him sooner if I had said something. Maybe they could have saved him if I had run fast enough and gotten help. It was supposed to be me. I wanted to scream in his parents' faces at his funeral, but I said nothing. It's remained my secret. It was mine and mine alone. The witch knew. Why else would she have this in her cemetery? It didn't make sense because they told me he had been turned ash and bone. Perhaps that was true, but it didn't matter here. Because here was the witch's realm. She decided what her reality comprised. I saw it so clearly. I imagined Aiden's bloated face gazing up at me from underneath the ground. His torso would be splayed open like the fish in marine bio, and his eyes would be full of algae and grave dirt. I'm sorry, Aiden, I said. I am so sorry. At my words, as though inscribed by an invisible hand, letters appeared and formed into one word. Sacrifice. It glowed blue like the ocean. This is dumb. A voice said behind me. I jumped. It was Madeline, she scowled at the headstone. I mean, this is cool and all, but uh, how is it supposed to help? But I knew what to do, and I knew how to get in. Without a word, I ran towards the brook, which in the night looked like it were full of black ink. It was much deeper than I thought, and that was good. That made it easy for me to sink into its depths and drown as I should have years ago. This will show you guys the way, I thought. It will. I know it. At least you guys will get out. Don't you get it? I'm the sacrifice. I have to drown. It's supposed to be me in that grave. Not Aiden. The cool water burned my lungs, but eventually, the pain subsided, and I didn't hurt anymore. I couldn't feel anything. Everything was so calm and peaceful. My vision was fading. If this was what dying was, it wasn't so bad. It should have been you. It wasn't bad at all. You should have died instead. I'm lying on mud, and soft lips are pressed against my own. I recognize the shape of those lips. I have kissed them countless times. They breathed into me until I could breathe on my own. I vomited brackish water, and when I opened my eyes, Beck was above me. She was soaking wet and looked terrified. What the fuck is wrong with you? She gasped. What the fuck, Lou? I tried to answer, but more water bubbled up my throat. It was supposed to be me, I murmured. I was supposed to die. Well, great, well done, you nearly did, Beck snapped. She grabbed and held me and kissed me hard. Don't ever do that again, she whispered into my ear. Her breath was so warm. I can't lose you, too. I can't. I hugged her back but said nothing. I was exhausted. When I felt I could stand, Beck, helped me up. I shivered, it was night now, and I was drenched. If the witch didn't kill me, my catching pneumonia definitely would. I felt horrible that Beck had gotten wet too. But I had to do it. It was the only way we could move forward. Back at Aiden's grave, I saw that the headstone had been wiped clean no epigraph, no drawing, just a smooth black slate. I am so sorry, Aiden, I thought, and the ground underneath me trembled ever so slightly. From the soil, I heard in a small voice that would always belong to a child. I forgive you. I touched the headstone again, and this time, it didn't just glow. It rumbled and shifted forward, and I had to jump back to avoid falling into the chasm and the stairs that had been revealed. Steep stairs that, from what I could see, led deep into the ground. The light from the moon revealed at the very bottom a solid stone path. Always with the paths. 
There was a long silence, and then Madeline giggled uneasily. This is some Harry Potter shit, she said, still laughing. Some Legend of Zelda shit, Ezra added. I laughed weakly. Good job nearly killing yourself for this, Beck said, but she didn't sound mad. She sounded like she wanted to laugh as well. No problem, I croaked, and I cleared my throat. Well, should we go in? Beck nodded. Ezra went down first, then Madeline, then me, and last came Beck. Her hand was warm on the small of my back. I was grateful that if I died here, I would not die alone. At least I would be surrounded by friends and the woman I loved. We descended into a darkness I have never known before, and I watched the moon until it vanished and the dirt swallowed us. Posted by you slash Errol's okay. The Witch's Grave, Part 3, The Church. Part 3, Chapter 1. We were going to move to the city, Madeline hissed in the dark. Los Angeles or maybe New York. We would go out to dinner every single night and go to the best clubs. I don't want kids, but if I have a girl, that would be okay. She paused. I need a nanny, though. I heard Beck sigh and knew she was rolling her eyes. Since we had entered this black abyss, Madeline had been talking non-stop. From her dreams to her once to the perfect fairy tale life she had imagined since she was four. I think she did it out of fear and nervousness, and even though she was driving us insane, I understood. God, please make it end. Ms. Witch, you can't be as bad as this. Beck muttered. She was so close to me that I felt her hot breath on my neck. She gripped my hips so we wouldn't get separated in the darkness. Her touch was calming. Ezra held Madeline's dying phone in his hand, and he used the flashlight feature to guide us. Of all of us, Madeline had been the only one to defy Caleb's wishes to leave our phones behind. I love you, Caleb. Madeline had drawled to him. I do, but what if I get a DM on Instagram about the shoe giveaway I entered? We had wrestled the sleek iPhone from her when we remembered she had it. There was no reception, but we still tried to call for help, and a shrill garbled shriek answered. It felt as though we had been walking forever. We were bunched together, holding one another as though we were in a conga line. It smelled awful down here, like spoiled fruit and mildew. Occasionally, dirt rained down on my head, and after inhaling a spider, I kept my mouth shut, unlike Madeline. I think we're almost there, Ezra said. The ground is changing. It's not dirt anymore, it's stone, and I can see light up ahead. A lamp, maybe? I felt a wave of relief wash over me. I never thought of myself as claustrophobic, but I kept thinking of the tunnel caving in and burying us. I saw the light Ezra referred to, it bobbed up and down. It was coming right at us, I realized, and I knew that whatever it was wasn't good. Run, my mind told me. Run, I yelled, but it was too late. It was upon us. Caleb's distorted face bloomed into view above me. The lamp he held in his mangled hand cast him in a sickly yellow glow. I watched in horror as his broken legs and disjointed arms crawled on the ceiling like a humanoid spider. He leered at us. His neck crunched as his head twisted around and around. His bones ground together, and the sound made me heave. And then glass shattered, and we were plunged into darkness. I heard screams and was thrown to the side, and a body threw itself on top of me. I felt shaggy hair on my cheek. Beck. Madeline's scream curdled my blood. Help me, she shrieked, and her voice faded as the Caleb monster dragged her along the ground. We ran towards her, and she kept screaming, she kept yelling, and we heard a wet gurgling sound. And then it stopped. The sudden silence was terrifying. Ezra was wildly waving the phone around. Come on, he said through gritted teeth. Don't die, please. Beck reached her first. She had always been the fastest. I found her, you guys, she called. I've got her. Is she okay? Ezra yelled back. I, I don't know, Beck stuttered. I don't think she's breathing. Wait, I feel a pulse, but it's so faint. Ezra and I hurried, and he dropped to his knees next to Beck. The phone in his hand shook as he trembled, and we sat in darkness as he steadied himself and shone the light on his sister. Madeline lay on her back, limbs limp, covered head to toe in thick blood. There was so much blood. Her brown face was flush with it. It was so thick and dark that it took me a minute to realize how the blood had pooled in her eyes. It nestled in her sockets like red puddles. I took a step forward, and my shoe made a sick squelching sound as I stepped on something soft, whatever it was sprayed me in a thick gelatinous liquid. Everything became still, and without a word, I lifted my foot, and Ezra shone the light on the sole of my sneaker. He gasped and then turned his head to vomit, reminiscent of his sister after Caleb had died. I grabbed the phone, 
and the iris of Madeleine's burst eyeball appeared to swivel at me. Its fluids and blood stuck to me like glue, and suddenly the tunnel was full of noise. Screaming. And this time, I wasn't screaming alone. Madeline, Ezri yelled. He grabbed his sister's shoulders and propped her up. The blood in her socket spilled down her cheeks like gelatinous tears. Her eyes had been scooped out, and her slack mouth fell open. Her tongue smacked wetly onto the ground and curled like a salted slug. He took her eyes. My mind babbled, pulled out her tongue, and then forced her to eat it. He took out her eyes. Where is the other one? Where is he? I looked around wildly, but I couldn't see in this blanket of utter darkness. She's alive. Beck shrieked. You guys, she's still alive. Madeline coughed, and blood sprayed everywhere. She's choking. Ezra screamed. Beck held Madeline as Ezra stuck a finger down her throat. A putrid mixture of blood and vomit poured out of her mouth. I could hear her ragged breathing and a tinny noise from her blood slick lips. She's trying to scream, I realized. And she can't. Madeline's hands flew towards her face. She dipped a finger into one of her empty sockets and moaned in despair and pain. She started rocking back and forth, gasping and trying to talk. It's okay, Ezra soothed. He sounded shattered. His strength was fading. You're going to be okay, Maddie. He rubbed her back and whispered, but Madeline shook him off. She got to her feet and loomed over him, her eyes weeping, her mouth a black hole. She ran. She ran down the tunnel, gasping, and a keening scream echoed around us as we chased her. With every step she took, a light flickered on. They lined the tunnel, which I realized wasn't dirt but cold, hard stone. Bodies were embedded in the earth, and ghosts whispered and touched us as we passed. Madeline kept running, and I saw the door, appear. Finally. We were so close. We could get out. After we climbed the bell, we could get help. We could leave. Madeline, stop. Madeline, Ezri yelled. Please stop. She had reached the end but instead of going through the door, Madeline took a step to the left. Her head lolled onto her neck, and when she looked at us, I knew she couldn't see us, but it sure felt like it. Before we could reach her, she slammed her head against the stone wall. Ezra tried to grab her, but she bashed her head again and again. I have never heard a sound like that before. Blood and brain splattered everywhere. Madeline's body crumpled, and what was left of her face was smeared on stone. I wiped the blood from my eyes and looked at Ezra. He stood above his sister, covered in soft tissue and shards of bone. I could hear his fast, ragged breathing from here. The door creaked and then opened. The witch peered at us, her lips were curled into a mocking smile. She stared at us and with those impossibly long arms she grabbed Madeline by the ankle, and slowly pulled her through the doorway. Madeline's ruined face left a trail of blood. The door slammed shut and all that was left was silence. I didn't know what else to do, so I opened my mouth and screamed. 